Turn the microphone on. After we turn the microphone on, let's turn in our Bible to Matthew chapter 21 this evening. Matthew chapter 21. Our subject subject has been the kingdom as spoken of in the Bible and how it relates to the church or how does the church relate to the kingdom. And uh, though our sessions have not all been in a row, uh, two weeks ago was the last time we were looking at this topic together. And uh, we've been talking about in tracing the kingdom through the Bible. When you come to the Gospels, and that's where we're going to be tonight, Uh, The kingdom, when we read the kingdom of God, I want you to understand that that's the overarching rule of God. In your notes, we spoke about the kingdom. God is sovereign over all his creation. All right? Uh, Psalm 103, the Lord is seated on his throne in heaven. He rules over all. He does whatever he pleases. God is truly sovereign over all. Now, when we look on earth, we don't necessarily see that happening. Matter of fact, we've got some elections coming up, and I wonder <laughs> sometimes when I see all that's going on. It's amazing in the kingdoms of men that it's always evil that seems to be rising to the top of these kingdoms of men. Even, even governments that start out good, it seems like it doesn't take long before all the badness seems to find its way up to the top. The kingdom of God is the rule over God, the rule of God over everything. Birds, bees, men, governments, you name it. God rules over angels, men. He is in control. And we'll look at tonight, even though it doesn't look like it sometimes to us, God has not abdicated his throne. God has not set aside his scepter. He does rule in the affairs of men. Now this does, this does admittedly provide a challenge for us. How in the world do you reconcile the sovereignty of God and the will of man? Because there's lots of people that exercise their will against God, don't they? There sure are. We've got some in our country, and they happen to have been elected to some pretty important positions. Yes, it's, it's, this is nothing new under the sun. This has been going on for millennia. The people have been exercising their will against God's will. How do you reconcile the two? Well, I want you to understand the Bible doesn't reconcile the two. They are laid down side by side in the scriptures as both true. They're both true. The fact that mankind exercises his will, whether to the glory of God or in rebellion against God, does not hinder God. He's not thwarted in any way. God is working out his perfect plan and his perfect will. He's doing it in accordance with his time. He's doing it in his way. And all the while, he's giving opportunity for people to repent and turn their hearts to him. He's doing that. And God is not troubled about it at all. He's not troubled about it. We don't need to get troubled about these things. We need to trust in God, even when it gets very, very dark. Now, our subject is the kingdom, the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is God's rule over all his creation, birds, bees, angels, people, you name it, God is ruling over all his creation. Now, when we come to the kingdom of heaven, the the term the kingdom of heaven, Matthew's the one who uses it in his gospel. Now we're getting to an aspect of the kingdom that we've been talking about. God exercises his rule. He chooses to do this through men. God chose, God gave Adam and Eve dominion over all creation. God was choosing to exercise his sovereign rule through Adam and Eve. And uh, we might look at that and say that didn't go well. Adam and Eve decided we're going to eat the fruit, even though God said not to. That didn't hinder God in any way, didn't thwart him. But we see, even though God exercises his rule through chosen ones at certain times, and men fail, and they do, Yet God continues to work. He continues to work. For example, 
Eventually, in Genesis chapter 12, we find that God called Abraham, didn't he? Abram at the time. And God made promises to Abraham that were going to affect all peoples for all time. But he was going to do it by bringing a nation into existence, the nation of Israel. And God gave to the nation of Israel a kingdom. We saw that in Exodus chapter 19. He called them to be a kingdom of priests. God wanted to exercise his rule through the nation of Israel, the theocracy. Um, Israel hasn't done very well with that. They didn't do very well with that. We looked at this together. And so God foretold through Daniel, we looked at this together, there were going to be four Gentile empires. Four Gentile empires because God was bringing his punishment upon his people Israel. They were going into captivity. God brought them back into the land. A remnant returned. They rebuilt the temple. They rebuilt the walls under Nehemiah. All of it under Gentile rule. The Jews are still dealing with that even to this day, even to this day. God gave a dream to Nebuchadnezzar, and he told Nebuchadnezzar, you are the head of gold. The dream was a statue, head of gold, shoulders and chest of silver, a midriff of brass, legs of iron, and feet of iron and clay. And God defined what that was, four Gentile empires specifically that would be trampling Jerusalem and the promised land. That's the focus of Daniel. But these empires, God gave them authority in the kingdoms of men. We saw in Daniel chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar learned a very, very powerful lesson about that. Nebuchadnezzar was exalted in his kingdom in Babylon, and he thought he was everything. So God cut him down like a tree. Cut him down, and he did it with insanity put an insanity on Nebuchadnezzar until seven times passed over him. And when Nebuchadnezzar's reason returned to him, he did what every sane person ought to do. He looked to heaven and he praised the one true God of heaven who rules in the affairs and over the kingdoms of men. Nebuchadnezzar learned that lesson. Sadly, there's many, many a leader who has not yet learned that lesson. Nebuchadnezzar learned it the hard way. He learned that God is ruling over all. After Babylon, God said there would be another Gentile power, the Medes and the Persians. And they came, they deposed the Babylonians, and they established an even greater kingdom. And then their rule was succeeded by Greece. The midriff of brass is identified in Daniel chapter 8 as the kingdom of Greece. And so the kingdom of Greece came and they expanded their rule even greater than the Persians expanded their rule, a tremendous Gentile rule and empire. And after the Greeks, this is all history for you and me, Daniel was puzzled. He lost a lot of sleep over this. It was all future for him. God gave him little bits. This is all history for you and me. Who came after the Greeks? The Romans did, the Romans. That's identified in Daniel chapter nine, although it's tricky, they're not named. It just says that the Messiah was going to come. Seventy weeks, 70 periods of seven years are determined upon Israel, and after 69 of those sevens, Messiah would be cut off. And the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, who came in fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophecies, was cut off under the Gentile rule of the Romans. But there's one period of seven years that has not yet been fulfilled, and in going all the way back to Daniel chapter 2, <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar said there would be a feat of iron mixed with clay. A revived Roman Empire was going to come back to power. This is none other than the empire of the Antichrist as revealed by Jesus in Matthew 24, the Apostle Paul, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and God revealed it to John the Apostle in Revelation, the book of Revelation. The revived Roman Empire, the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition will rule over that kingdom of men that's yet to come. Now we're focused in on the nation of Israel, the theocracy. There were prophecies we saw where God said that he was going to reestablish the kingdom in Israel. We looked at passages like Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. We looked at passages like Jeremiah chapter 23. A king shall reign. And Israel was looking for that in Jesus' day. Rightfully so. They're still looking for a Messiah, but they missed it. Their Messiah came. They missed it. That's what we're going to look at tonight. And when their Messiah came, 
They wanted to see a king rule. They wanted a king to throw off this Roman Empire. But that's not what happened. What did happen? That's what we want to talk about tonight. Did you find Matthew 21? We are going to look at our Bible. Matthew chapter 21. May I point your eyes to verse 43. Now I will read the context, but look at verse 43. Jesus said, Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. Jesus announced that the kingdom was going to be taken away. Now, what did he mean here by it's going to be given to a nation bearing fruits? I want you to notice that this word nation is not in the plural, it's in the singular. That's very important. Whenever this word is nations plural, it refers to the Gentiles, the nations. But it's not here, it's nation. Jesus used this word this way one other time, and I believe what Jesus is referring to is a generation of Jews, because Jesus is talking about the Jewish kingdom. We'll see that tonight. He's talking about the Jewish kingdom, and he's not saying he's going to give the Jewish kingdom to the Gentiles. To be sure, the Gentiles were reigning over the Jews, and even today, the Jews have a tough time being independent in their own land. It's only been since the 1940s that Israel has come back into the land with some bit of sovereignty that's challenged all the time for them, all the time. But they're there in unbelief. They haven't received Jesus Christ. There'll be no glorious rule and reign apart from the King of Kings who's going to come and establish a Jewish kingdom that will rule over all the world. Jesus here, I believe, is saying this generation, the Jews that were alive in Jesus' day, were not going to see the kingdom. It was taken away from them. But there is going to be a generation of Jews that's going to see it. There's going to be a nation of believing Jews who will see the kingdom established. That's what I believe Jesus was talking about. Now let's just back up and catch a couple things here so we can ask the question, what happened to the kingdom? Because if we understand what the Bible says about what happened to the kingdom, it's going to help us to understand how the church relates to the kingdom right now. Sadly, there's so much confusion. Some people relate the church to the kingdom. Some people say the church is the kingdom. Some people say the church is spiritually the kingdom. There's all kinds of things. I want to know what the Bible says. I hope you do too. First of all, let's back up. Let's go to Matthew chapter 3. And I want you to see, before Jesus, in Matthew 21, says the kingdom is going to be taken away from you, I want you to see that John the Baptist preached the same kingdom that was foretold in the Old Testament. Matthew chapter 3, verse 2. I'll begin in verse 1. In those days, John the Baptist, literally John the Baptizer, came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I want you to notice that word, repent. You might want to underline it in your Bible. John the Baptist said the kingdom of heaven's at hand. That means it's near. It's right here, near to you. This is the same message that Jesus preached. Turn over one chapter to Matthew chapter 4 and verse 17. In Matthew 4, 17, from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I want you to underline that word, repent. I want you to make a note of it. Jesus said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom is near. This is the Old Testament kingdom that was foretold in the book of Daniel that would be a Jewish kingdom after the head of gold, after the chest and arms of silver, after the midriff of bronze, after the legs of iron and the feet of iron mixed in clay. Nebuchadnezzar saw a stone not made with hands, come out of the sky, and it crashed into the feet of the statue. It pulverized the entire statue into dust, and the dust blew away, and the stone became a great mountain. Because in those days, God is going to establish his kingdom through his son, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. This is the kingdom that was foretold in the Old Testament. Daniel chapter 7 talks about this. Uh, this is what the angel Gabriel said to Mary 
When the angel Gabriel in Luke chapter 1 came to announce to Mary, you are going to be with child. Now, how is this possible? I've never had relations with a man. <laughs> but Mary was willing, be it unto me, the handmaid of the Lord. Wonderful testimony. The angel Gabriel told to her about the son that would be born to her. First of all, he explained it. God, the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. The power of the highest is going to overshadow you. And that which will be conceived in your womb, Mary, will be of the Holy Spirit of God. Marvelous, miraculous, virgin birth. Jesus Christ, God, became flesh. But the angel went on to say, he shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of whom? His father David. And he shall reign over the house of whom? Jacob. For how long? Forever. You guys know these. I know it's not December 25th, but I'll just shake you up. I know. This was the promise. In the Old Testament, this is what the angel Gabriel echoed in regard to Jesus, who was going to be born to the Virgin Mary. This is what John the Baptist preached. This is what Jesus preached. Go to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. It's important for us to consider the scriptures so we can understand. In Matthew chapter 10, the Lord Jesus Christ sent out his disciples. I'm going to pick it up in verse 5. Then these twelve Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles. I want to say so many things. The first one is you, you're tempted to have a sad look, aren't you? I am. I'm a Gentile. Well, no longer. <laughs> I'm a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ. I'm not a Gentile anymore. I'm a child of the Most High God. But that's what we were, Gentiles, before we trusted in Jesus Christ. And Jesus said to the twelve, don't go to the Gentiles. Is that in your Bible? Here it is. Why? Because the message they were going to preach. Now take heart. Jesus is going to send these same twelve men into all the world, including the Gentiles. But they're going to preach a different message later on than this one he tells them to preach here. Notice, do not enter the city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of whom? Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Same kingdom. Same kingdom. Now, Jesus and John the baptizer both preached that there was a necessary, there was an appropriate getting ready for the kingdom. Something was needed before the kingdom could come. Do you remember what it was? Repent. There was a preparation of heart that had to take place. You know, after Jesus fed the 5,000, they wanted to take Jesus and make him king. And he disappeared from them. He wouldn't let them do that. Why? Because they had not prepared their hearts. Remember what Jesus said to Nicodemus? It's recorded in the Gospel of John, chapter 3. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. There needs to be an appropriate preparation of the heart to receive the king. Now, this kingdom of which Jesus preached, John the baptizer preached, he sent the ten out telling the house of Israel, the lost sheep of the house of Israel, the kingdom's at hand, and it was because the king was right here. <laughs> here he was, the son of David, son of the Most High God, the Messiah. Here he is, and he's offering. It was a genuine offer. He was offering them the kingdom on the basis of repentance. Now, the kingdom he offered was a national kingdom. It was a national kingdom. It wasn't some little group that he wanted to get together, a little sect or something. It was for the nation of Israel, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And if the kingdom was national, the repentance had to be national too. That's in Zechariah. In the book of Zechariah, I'm not going to turn there now, but in the book of Zechariah, chapter 12, verses 10 through 14, when God pours a spirit of grace upon his people and they repent, it's going to be the whole nation that's going to repent. If you don't repent, you will have no part. You won't. Jesus is going to take care of that. He told them so in Matthew chapter 25. He's going to separate them. And there's only those who repent and properly prepare their heart who are going to initially go into the kingdom. 
That's what God says. There has to be repentance. There has to be proper preparation of heart. Did the people receive him? The answer is no, they didn't. Let's go back to Matthew 21, where we were. Matthew chapter 21. There were some who did, praise the Lord. There was a small remnant. As a matter of fact, we read in Acts chapter 1, about 120 of them, there were more. Because remember, Jesus revealed himself to 500 of them when he arose from the dead. 120 of them were gathered together in Jerusalem. That's nothing compared to how many there should have been. There weren't many. There were not many. But there was a small group that did believe. Jesus here in Matthew chapter 21, I now want to begin in verse 33, gave a parable. He taught a heavenly truth through a simple story. Beginning in verse 33. Here another parable. There was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it. It dug a wine press in it and built a tower. And he leased it to vine dressers and went away into a far country. The Jewish person listening to this parable would have immediately connected these words that I just read to you with Isaiah chapter 5. God there likens the nation of Israel to his vineyard, to his vineyard, Isaiah chapter 5. Yes. Jesus then said in verse 34, now, when the vintage time drew near, when it was the right time to reap a harvest, he sent his servants to the vine dressers that they might receive its fruit. And the vine dressers took his servants, beat one, killed one, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did likewise to them. Then last of all, he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. But when the vine dressers saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. So they took him, cast him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine dressers? Now, these who are hearing Jesus got so caught up in this parable, look at their response. They said to him, he will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to other vine dressers who will render to him the fruits in their seasons. I want to ask you a question before I go on. I'm going to read some more. What kind of fruit do you think God's looking for from his vineyard? Maybe repentance? God's looking for the fruit of a repentant heart. And there was no fruit. And those who were there treated the prophets miserably, miserably. We're told, I think, that they cut Isaiah in half. Isn't that respect for a prophet? We'll take a saw and cut you right, put you in a log, cut you right in half. No, that's rejection. That is rejection. On and on. And then, of course, you know Jesus here is foretelling his own death. He's the son. And they killed him. They took him out of the city and they crucified him. Verse 42, Jesus said, Have you never read the scriptures, the stone which the builders rejected? Notice these words, the builders rejected. What did the builders do to the stone? They rejected the stone. Jesus here is quoting from Psalm 118. And they knew it because they knew their Old Testament scriptures. You'll see that in verse 45 and 46. They knew what Jesus was saying when he quoted Psalm 118. Have you never read in the scriptures, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. Repentance. Let's start there. And whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. Now, when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking of them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitudes, because the multitudes, they took him for a prophet. And so Jesus here now reveals that the kingdom was rejected. As a matter of fact, go back to chapter 12. Go back to Matthew chapter 12. You know this passage very well. Just probably the, the most prominent example of it, we could look at several, but the most prominent example of the rejection of Jesus from the leaders is found here in Matthew chapter 12, verse 22, 
One was brought to Jesus who was demon-possessed, blind and mute, and he healed him. Isn't that amazing? Just Here's a demonic blindness, a demonic muteness. No surgery was going to fix these things, but Jesus healed him. And it caused a tremendous stir so that the blind and the mute man both spoke and saw, and all the multitude were amazed and said, could this be the son of David? Here they are. They have an undeniable miracle of the Messiah as foretold in the prophecies of Isaiah. And they're now, at, is, is this the son of David? The Pharisees did not lose a second. We see here in verse 24, when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of demons. That's rejection and that is rejection of the highest order. It is rejection of God of the most blackest and darkest measure to accuse God of performing his divine power in healing a blind, mute son of Israel in doing it in the power of Satan. Jesus is going to help them to understand they, they don't even know what they're talking about. This doesn't even make sense what they're saying. This was rejection, and it, it, it caused a stir. Jesus addressed the foolishness of something like that, but notice in verse 28, Jesus said, if I do cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has what? Come upon you. It's at hand. It's in the presence of the king. It was in their midst, and he demonstrated the power of it, didn't he? Because he demonstrated it over Satan. He was showing Satan to be nothing. This was God, the Messiah, who was in their midst. But they rejected him. I want you to notice, please, verses 31 and 32. I really want to hit this real quick. Therefore, I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word, please notice, against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. Now, what these people did here is not something that you and I can duplicate today. Jesus, in the flesh, performed a miracle as a demonstration of the power of God in their midst and they attributed it to the darkness of Satan himself. That's the, what this passage is often called the unforgivable sin. So many people today get caught up, did I commit the unpardonable sin or the unforgivable sin? Did I do that? This was a specific thing that was done while Jesus was in their midst and was demonstrating the very power of God in presentation of the kingdom of God to the nation of Israel. That cannot be repeated right now in this age, all right? That's just not repeatable right now. So that's the unpardonable sin that these men committed. In a sense, what they did was they, in rejecting Jesus Christ, what did they do? What other hope is there? And they did it in the face of the power of God being demonstrated before them unpardonable and that's what they did that's what they did and so if you will this is the rejection of the king and it's made clear if you will it's like the final straw that broke the camel's back that's it turn with me to Luke chapter 19 Luke chapter 19 the nation did not would not repent and so the Lord Jesus Christ addressed that. When we come to Luke chapter 19, we have the Lord Jesus Christ approaching Jerusalem in the very same week that he's going to be crucified. We have his triumphal entry listed in verse 28 of this chapter, just so you get a sense of where we are. Jesus has just been to the home of Zacchaeus, and Zacchaeus, a Jewish man, did repent. And Jesus praised him for that. But there weren't many who did. And notice in verse 11, Luke 19, verse 11. Now, as they heard these things, he spoke another parable. What things? About Zacchaeus and how he turned to the God. And Jesus said, salvation has come to this man's home, verses 9 and 10. And when they heard these things, he spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem and because 
they thought the kingdom would appear immediately. Now, there was a remnant who did believe. And they knew this was the Messiah. And they knew their Old Testament scriptures, that Messiah was coming to establish the kingdom. They were aware that Jesus was preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so the anticipation among the believing Jews was very high. Now watch what Jesus tells them. The Lord Jesus Christ then said in verse 12, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So he called 10 of his servants and delivered to them 10 minas and said to them, do business till I come. Until I come, do business. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. There's the rejection. You see, Jesus is making it clear the kingdom is not about to appear. It's not going to. Why? Because of rejection. The citizens, there were some that received him, but the nation did not. They rejected him. And I've already shown you, this really culminates when Jesus is standing before Pilate, and Pilate brings Jesus to them, and they said, we have no king but Caesar. And that's what Jesus is speaking about here. The citizens hated him. They sent a delegation after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. And so it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded his servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. So the parable goes on how there's going to be a judgment of how God's servants did business how did they occupy while he was gone when he returned? Everyone's given to give an account to the Lord, you know. Not a one of us will not give an account. Everyone will. For believers, it'll be a time of rewards. For unbelievers, when they stand before the Lord, it will be for judgment. The Lord Jesus Christ here makes it clear in verse 14. He was rejected. And so, going into a far country, he was going to receive a kingdom. Now, if you remember when we went over Daniel chapter 7 together, remember they brought the Son of Man before the Ancient of Days? And when they brought the Son of Man before the Ancient of Days, then the Ancient of Days bestowed upon him a kingdom. That's what Jesus is referring to here. He's going to come back to establish his kingdom because he will have received it from God who's seated on his throne. And I, I made a big point of it on purpose at the beginning. Has God abdicated his throne? Has God laid aside his scepter? What if people reject his rule and authority? What if even the authority he has committed to them, they misuse and even abuse? Is that going to stop God? No. He sent his son. And in the plan of God, his son would be rejected. That was a part of God's plan. And he would go home to glory to receive a kingdom. Why? To be sent back. To be sent back, having received the kingdom, to do what? Establish it right here on earth. That's what Jesus Christ is returning to do. He's going to do it. We saw it last time. Go quickly to Matthew 25. I don't want you to believe me. I want you to see it in your Bible. Matthew 25. Verse 31, the Lord Jesus Christ speaking to his disciples. He's now very close to the cross, getting very close. And he gives them in chapters 24, especially chapter 24, but in chapters 24 and 25, we have the prophecies of the king. Here's the prophecies, and he's speaking about that 70th week of Daniel. It's still yet future for you and I. It hasn't happened yet. But in speaking about that, Jesus speaks about when he will return. You see that in verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, and then he will sit on what? The throne in his glory. He's going to sit on a throne of glory. And he's going to sit on a throne of glory in Jerusalem as the son of David. He's going to establish his kingdom. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ is going to do. Uh, let's go to Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. 
Now, I have been typing these notes up for you, but tonight you have to write them out. Luke chapter 17, notice please verses 22 through 25. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ was in verse 20, the, the Pharisees demanded of him. Notice this, verse 20. Now when he was asked by the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God would come. Now they were right to ask this question. These Pharisees knew their Old Testament scriptures. They knew the promises of a coming kingdom. And they wanted to know, when is this kingdom coming? When is it coming? Now, had they brought forth the fruits of repentance? Jesus demonstrates that to them. First of all, Jesus said, and we looked at this earlier, the kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, see here, see there, for indeed the kingdom of God, my Bible says, is within you. But I have a side note in my margin that says the wording could be translated in your midst. It's the same word, but instead of saying within you, it could be translated in your midst. And that's what I believe Jesus was saying to them. You don't have to go looking for the kingdom. Look over here. It's right here. It's right here in your midst. It was in their midst in the person of Jesus Christ. They were asking the king. But did they receive him as the king? Watch, watch what it says. Then he said to his disciples, The days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And they will say to you, look here or look there. Do not go after them or follow them. For as the lightning that flashes out of one part under heaven shines to the other part under heaven, so also the Son of Man will be in his day. Jesus is not speaking about the rapture here. Jesus defined this in Matthew 24 and 25. This is his literal second coming to earth. He will be very visible to everyone. Like, you know, you've seen a lightning flash? I've shared this story before. When I lived in Woburn, there was a lightning flash. Now, I was standing in my apartment washing the dishes. I found out the next day the lightning struck across the street behind me. All right? I thought I saw the street come down right in front of me. It, I, I was washing dishes. You know how that is, you know, touching water. Whoa! You know how it is when lightning hits that close within 30 feet of you? The, the flash and the clap of thunder were instant together. My heart was out of my mouth. <laughs> I found out next day, my neighbor across the street showed me where the light hit a tree in his backyard. He had, he had an old metal fence. He had taken it down and he buried the metal rails. He didn't know what to do with them. He buried it in the ground like four inches deep. Do you know the lightning went down the tree and traveled along those metal pipes he buried, ripping up a four-inch trench through the ground? It came to a knee wall that he had, and he had a little walkway, just a little cement walkway between the knee wall and his house. The lightning went straight through the air across that walkway, and he had an outside spotlight. It went into the electricity through that light. He showed me, blew it out, burnt it, and it went straight to his electrical panel, burning the wall and everything. And it, that all happened behind me, and it looked like it happened right in front of me. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ is using as an illustration here. When Jesus Christ returns to this earth, every eye shall see him. That's what he's talking about here, his second coming. And every eye will see him. But look at verse 25. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by what? This generation. That's exactly what we saw tonight they did. They rejected him. But this was a part of the plan of God. Because why? When Jesus Christ was rejected and crucified, he provided salvation for all mankind. Now this is where we're going to pick it up. And I'm sorry, once again, it's going to be in two weeks. <laughs> Not next Sunday night, but two weeks from tonight, we're going to pick it up. Because in Matthew chapter 13 now, Jesus Christ addressed in a series of parables what was going to happen between his virgin birth after his death, burial, and resurrection and ascension and his second coming. It's going to talk about what is going to take place during that whole period of time between when Jesus ascended to heaven and before he comes again to establish his kingdom. And it relates directly to where you and I are today. It'll be very interesting as we look at it together. May God encourage our hearts with a couple things as we close tonight. Number one, if you want to know you need to go to the Word of God. Does not the Word of God reveal God's plans and purposes to us? 
Now, I will admit, this takes some study. I know I've spent a lot of time studying it. And the more I study it, the more I find out I need to study it even more. It's work. But the answer is right here in the book. Do you know that any truth that's in this book, you can take it home? Do you know that God will always fulfill his word? You can count on it. Now, that's something you can take with you into this week. You can look to the word of God and you can count on it because all that God has said, he will do to the glory of God. May God comfort your hearts. God is in control. You may feel like things in your life are spinning out of control. I want you to know God is in control. Look up and God will give you grace as you trust in him for whatever you face this very hour. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you that you have not abdicated your throne. You truly rule over all. And so we bless your holy name and understand that you have a plan and a purpose. How thankful we are that it was a part of your plan and purpose that the gospel should go to all the nations, that we should hear the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ because you so loved the world that you gave your only begotten son, Jesus died on the cross and rose again that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Lord God, we want to thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.